Somewhere more or less close to you, there is a prison, and in that prison, a business transaction took place today, with the currency used being anything from ramen noodles to cigarettes. Prison economies are frowned upon and justice systems mostly try to destroy them. They are also a testament to something else, the power of one of our most basic instincts, the drive to want stuff. Wanting stuff has been part of the human experience since as far back as we can tell, and when people want other people's stuff, there are two ways of doing so. You can take their stuff or pay for their stuff. And if you pay for their stuff, that means that the money you spend will increase someone else's wealth, which is why states throughout most of history decided to bring up strict trade barriers and criminalize the trade between competing empires. All except for one, because that one was the one everyone was buying from. For almost 2,000 years, the world revolved around China, and all those empires, kingdoms and republics that banned trade amongst themselves all traded with China. In Europe, the Middle East and America, our understanding of history is dominated by this hemisphere of the world with an emphasis on the last 200 years. However, you gain a lot of insight by viewing human history from a Eurasian perspective, specifically the geopolitical maneuvering around China. The Chinese market and Chinese products are what dominated European, Middle Eastern and even African economies for almost 2,000 years. The Chinese had the world's largest labor pool, the world's most efficient state and the world's most wanted products. Silk, tea, salt, sugar, porcelain and spices were China's main export and the only payment they accepted was silver. European, Asian and African states fought wars over the control of these lucrative trade routes. Greeks, Romans, Persians, Byzantians, Venetians, Indians, Mongols, Arabs, Turks, many of the wars we know from our history books were fought to gain a more favorable position by conquering trade routes or ports in the world order the Eurasian world order within which China was the dominant economic power. And during those squabbles, a big game changer happened during the 1300s, the Ottomans, who gained control of trade routes between Europe and China and didn't lose control over them for hundreds of years. Europeans didn't like trading with Muslims, let alone paying tariffs to them, so they tried finding ways around. The English and Dutch tried sailing around Russia, where they only found more Russia. The Spanish sailed west, finding a place they had never heard of before, and the Portuguese sailed around Africa. All of them did this for one reason, find new trade routes to China, and only one of them succeeded. This new trade route meant that the Portuguese had to pay no more tariffs and taxes as they would have through other trade routes and was so profitable that they tried to keep it secret from others, which of course didn't work and others immediately tried taking it from them. The Spaniards uncovered silver in the new world which they used in their transactions with China, eventually even gaining a foothold in the Philippines to be closer to that trade route. But it was the new world where all the silver was mined that ultimately ultimately would lead to a change in the world order. Settlers who started to grow crops on what turned out to be some of the most fertile lands in the world started producing surplus that could sustain a large population, thereby increasing the labor pool of the Western Hemisphere, which, through innovation spurned on to expand trade, made products that decreased the reliance on those Far Eastern markets. The English and Dutch noticed that you could just occupy India and Indonesia rather than buy their products through the Chinese, which further decreased China's geopolitical dominance. Suddenly, China seemed far less important, and so did the trade routes to it. Different trade routes to India, the Caribbean, Malacca, the Gold Coast, Brazil and North America became more important. And by the time Europeans learned to make their own porcelain, China's relevance in global trade and affairs was getting eroded. With industrialization and increase in education, the geopolitical center of the world shifted away from a Eurasian world order to a more Euro-American world order. That shift completed itself in 1839, when the British Navy forced the Chinese to open its market and trade with them on their terms. The predominant global powers from that moment on are to be found in the Western Hemisphere and engaged in squabbles and conflicts over which one of them was the most dominant, with one of them eventually ending up on top. There are many names for the time period starting in the 1800s to today. Pax Britannica, Pax Americana, Modern Age, Space Age, Information Age, Atomic Age, Machine Age, Age of Ideology, Contemporary Age, Plastic Age and more. Whatever we name it, it's a result of European expansion, innovation and exploration starting in the 1400s with the initial goal of finding new trade routes to China. And it ended with Europeans not buying but taking their stuff and their geopolitical influence, thereby ending an almost 2,000 year long geopolitical world order in which China stood at the center. And whatever you may call the centuries of European global dominance, you shouldn't forget one important aspect of it that we often tend to forget and many don't even know. The Chinese also have a name for it.
Take a moment and look at everything on your desk, in your pockets or on your skin. Most of what you use to watch this video, what you wear to stay warm and what you might eat, drink or smoke as you watch this is imported. This is so normal to us that it never really stands out to us. Drinking Spanish wine with Brazilian grapes to complement the taste of Italian cheese as you wear a shirt made in Turkey with cotton produced in India. You might then share this video with an app produced by an American on a phone assembled in China of plastic parts made of Saudi oil in a German chemical plant powered by batteries made of lithium mined in Chile and functioning due to various microchips made of aluminium mined from Australia, cobalt from the Congo, Russian nickel and Chilean copper. Our modern consumer existence is however only a recent reality and we can put an exact date on when it came to be. April 26, 1956. If you remember from the previous chapter, for centuries trade was a weapon. Empires who competed for trade routes strictly criminalized trade between empires, attempting to gain monopolies and exploit the market needs of others. Foreign-made products were rare and, if existent at all, only came from colonies. That's until a certain Scotsman observed the group of smugglers illegally entering England with products made in France. He started asking himself why they did that, why they risked their lives and punishment to import foreign goods and then had a realization, sat down and wrote a series of books, which many today mistakenly believe to be just one book. In book four of Systems of Political Economy, he criticized the existent mercantile economic system that banned foreign imports. Trade with foreign powers and in foreign markets increases the wealth of domestic craftsmen and merchants, increases productivity through the import of resources used in the domestic industry. Merchants and businessmen are never content with domestic markets, but will continuously seek to expand both their markets and wealth. The market should, therefore, be set free from the restraints of sovereign geopolitical concern, and the wealth the manufacturers and merchants acquire will increase the wealth of the nation. His works were well received, but Britain clung on to a closed colonial preferential trading system. The Dutch embraced his ideas, but nowhere were his ideas as widely accepted, studied and implemented as in the New World. The American nation that was violently birthed from a British tax dispute grew in productivity through its ever-increasing labor pool, gradually over the course of a century changing the economic balance of the world and increasing its own dominance. And the core tenant of that ever-increasing economic power was an urge to sell what that ever-increasing labor pool produced to as many as possible. The Americans did so by breaking down trade barriers, by force, negotiation or forceful negotiation. Central America, South America, Japan, Caribbean, Philippines, China. Where other empires went to war to take other people's stuff, the Americans went to war to sell their stuff. And their biggest triumph came when European imperial ambitions flared up so high they burned themselves to the ground. A condition for American entry into that war was the disbandment of all colonial preferential trading systems. 1945 was the year of a global American triumph that would allow it to use its massive labor pool to sell its products to markets far and wide. There was, however, a problem. The structures of limited economic systems had ingrained themselves within the logistics of whatever global trade had existed until then. Shipping was a tedious process in which everything from ready-made machines, grain, cars and coal was tightly packed into the hull of a ship. Entire harbor industries and networks developed around this process and the loading of a ship could take up to a week, until the 26th of April 1956, when the ideal X set sail across the Atlantic. This doesn't look very special, it is an old converted World War II Liberty ship. What made it special was its cargo, containers. The previous year, the American businessman, Malcolm McLean, frustrated with the immense difficulties of loading and unloading goods on ships, trucks and trains, came up with the idea of a standard measure metal box. Specific for trade, unified international dimensions and easy to transport. The Americans would not adopt the metric system, but they certainly knew how to use it. This invention and the 26th of April 1956 are dates that will go down in human history of similar significance as the invention of the printing press. It completely revolutionized global trade. Suddenly, everything could be transported quickly, efficiently, at low cost across the entire world. America's goods fueled consumer economies around the world. American industry could cheaply and compactly import anything from bananas to metals needed in industry. An integrate network of interdependent markets developed that created our modern world. But the Americans also quickly learned something else. 
Germans make damn good cars, so do the Japanese and the Koreans. Mexican labor was cheaper than Michigan labor. Swiss banks were better at hiding financial misdeeds than Wall Street firms. French medical devices are excellent. The German chemical industry efficient. Chilean miners produce more copper at less of a cost. The global free market the Americans championed meant that in this global economy, the winners were determined by innovation and labor cost. And for the most part, despite all difficulties, it still worked out for them. For a time. Because across the ocean, the Chinese were internationally isolated and busy trying to achieve communism through a famine. Imagine doing the same thing for 3,000 years. That's pretty much what China did. For 3,000 years, it was ruled by an absolute monarch whose rule was legitimized by the mandate of heaven, a way of saying he keeps harmony through godly grace. If you have a problem seeing the significance, compare these 3,000 years to what happened in Europe throughout the same time. China had a great starting position in the game of civilizations, based around a fertile valley with a large labor pool, resources everyone wanted, a technology that produced products that everyone wanted, and natural borders that made it unattractive to invasion. So for 3,000 years, the worst that happened was a few invasions by Mongols and Uyghurs who stayed and became Chinese, thereby not really changing anything, or the country splitting up into warring states who couldn't agree who should be emperor. Overall, it was a comfortable situation to be in, and that's where China's problems began. It was too comfortable. They had everything they wanted and needed right at their doorstep ascribed to a state policy and philosophy of preserving the status quo and shunning outside influences, innovations and reforms. Outsiders were seen as mere barbarians who should be grateful that the emperor dignified their existence by taking their silver, while Arabs, Turks and then the Europeans innovated and explored to find new ways and means to get to what the Chinese had, the Chinese sat back and did nothing because they had all they wanted. The result was a political culture of complacency, arrogance and shunning of all things new, modern and foreign. The first British trading missions to China offered the Chinese their newest and most modern technological advances in deep water navigation, naval technology, military technology and education. And the Chinese rejected their offer in Latin, because that was the language of those Europeans they had the trade deals with. The fact that the Romans had stopped existing over a thousand years ago didn't matter to them in their cultural mindset. To them, the British were the same barbarians as the Romans. Those technologies were just barbarian trinkets, and the British should be grateful that the emperor would take their silver for a few tea leaves. Because from the perspective of an 18th century Chinese official, the only thing that had continuity and merit was the Chinese empire and its heavenly mandate, which had existed for thousands of years. Compared to that, who are those British with their ships, modern muskets, modern army, compared to 3,000 years of imperial continuity? The end of the world order. There are colonial legacies in many countries. In few places does that legacy reverberate as heavily as it does here. China entered a century of foreign domination and dictates, and unlike its neighbors, its emperors were unwilling to adapt and assimilate into a modern world, resulting in a growing number of dissenters who concluded that the old world was indeed what had to be overthrown. So ended the world's longest continuous social order and monarchy when China formed its first republic in 1911. But strangely, things continued as they did before, just under new flags. China split up into warring states as it had so many times before, with strong men weeding each other out until only the strongest were left, with completely new mandates of heaven. Only this time it came with the intervention of a foreign force that under the guise of liberation brutally slaughtered its way through the country in acts of cruelty and barbarity the world had seldom seen before or since. What China ended up with in the end was a mandate of heaven written by a German to establish heaven on earth. And it tried to do so by adopting the same disdain for outsiders that the empire it replaced had, and by starving its people. 
It had also lost all of the geopolitical influence it once had, resulting in great isolation. And its leader decided, with the same wisdom that caused the famine, to further that isolation even more. From 1950 onward, communist China went to war and fought border skirmishes with every single one of its neighbors, culminating in 1979 when a battered America, after fighting out of fear of Vietnam becoming a Chinese puppet, left Vietnam, only to then see the Chinese invade Vietnam because it refused to be their puppet which ended about as well as it did for the Americans. By the 1980s, when the global economy was roaring and international trade boomed like it never had before, China was one of the most isolated nations in the world. Before Nixon's visit, it had more in common with North Korea than any other country, a nation of indoctrinated, almost starving peasants in boiler suits, reciting the texts of the dear leader at every opportune moment. When China entered an era of economic restructuring under Deng Xiaoping, it did so not as a geopolitical move, certainly not to amass the wealth and power it has now, but a move out of desperation to break free from international isolation. China had lost many things throughout the last decades. Its dignity, brains, global influence, regional hegemony, puppet states, an entire generation, several national treasures, and the strategically important island. All it had to show for it was a second-hand ramshack Soviet nuclear weapons program. But it had still one very valuable asset, the world's largest labor pool. Just as in the Soviet Union, the Chinese economy was stagnant and dysfunctional by the 1970s. Unlike the Soviet Union, the Chinese Communist Party realized that continuing as if all was all right was a recipe for disaster. Therefore, it introduced an economic reform program. First, they broke up the collectivized farms and gave the land back to the peasants. Communism would no longer be achieved through a famine. Then they permitted private enterprise and foreign investment. China was to be turned into the world's factory for plastic rubbish. The small independent peasants generated a reliable food supply, whilst more and more companies moved production of cheap plastic products to China. By the late 1980s, government price controls were abolished, allowing people to sell produce and products at prices determined by the market. State industries were privatized and the Shanghai Stock Exchange was reopened for the first time in 40 years. The Chinese were now for the first time in decades themselves invested in a private economy. Political liberalization was attempted but resulted in a series of events that the government insists never happened. And large economic liberalization didn't occur until the 2000s, when the army was forced to give up its businesses, Mao's large welfare state was cut down, and large-scale privatization made 50% of China's economy private. This point at around 2005 is when our story in our lifetimes begins. The scale and size of China's economic growth left most of the world baffled and bewildered. For decades, under American leadership, a policy of market liberalization had been championed in what Reagan championed as a capitalist offensive. It was believed that open markets, free trade, and individual prosperity and wealth would bring freedom and democracy. The tyrannical regimes only need to open their economies to free trade, and the resulting middle class would hasten the downfall of the regime by demanding political freedoms. Reagan was wrong. The world found itself confronted with authoritarian capitalism instead. And even though some analysts believe this to be a new phenomenon, the truth of the matter is that authoritarian free market nations have existed throughout history, and most authoritarian regimes collapsed through revolutions led by the impoverished and not a middle class demanding political privileges. It would be wrong, though, to see China as a simple authoritarian capitalist state, or to conclude that it no longer is a communist country. The years of the most exponential economic growth coincided with the return of more conservative communist forces into power under Hu Jintao. He tightened the single-party control of the state, stopped privatization, created a system of national champions in which state-owned industry and their managers earned massive bonuses if they could run businesses that successfully competed with private enterprise. Communist power is not merely exercised from within the Politburo, but stretches from the chat in the streets, social media chat rooms, to decisions made in the boardrooms of corporations who have to tow to the Communist Party line. Because here is an uncomfortable truth that we are only just starting to realize. China's economic growth blinded us. It prevented us from seeing how its society developed, and what it developed into, and how.
Xi Jinping's story is a story tied deeply to the great story, the story of the country itself. It's a story in stark contrast to the one of the current president of the United States. Xi is a red prince, the son of one of the founding revolutionaries of the Chinese communist state, Xi Zhongshun, a hero of the civil war against Chinese nationalist forces and built a solid defensive war economy during the Japanese invasion. After the war, he was a member of the Central Committee, moving with his family into a wing of the Imperial Palace of Beijing. This is where Xi Jinping spent his early childhood. As famines ravaged the mainland, Xi enjoyed a privileged life and education amongst the party elite living in what was once the Emperor's Palace. Until 1966. When the Cultural Revolution swept the land, the Xi family lost everything. His father was publicly denounced as a reactionary, imprisoned and forced through humiliating rituals of self-deprecation and public humiliation. The family, like most other high-ranking communist officials, were forced out of the inner circles of power and the son was stripped from his father and the privileges he once had. Xi had a choice, denounce his own father or risk ostracization and even death. Xi chose to denounce his father and was clustered into a re-education system in which he had to constantly recite Mao and denounce his own family over and over and over again. At age 15, the former Red Prince was sent to agricultural re-education, a program in which the Chinese urban youth were collected onto trucks shipped out to the barren wastes of the outmost Chinese countryside to perform dangerous hard farming labor. Xi would spend the teenage years of his life digging ditches, breaking stones, and plowing fields. He would not be freed from this until Mao Zedong finally died after which he went to study chemistry, graduating with a degree in organic chemistry. As the former Communist Party elites and Red Princes regained the power they had held before Mao's death, Xi, through his father's influence, received the job as the Secretary of the Minister of Defense. But it was then when Xi did something unexpected that separates him from other Red Princes, but also from other world leaders. He refused to play the game of his father's political influence and decided not to take advantage of family ties as other Red Princes had. When Xi filed for membership of the Communist Party, he purposefully removed his father from his membership application. Xi removed himself from all influence his father had and started out as a minor official in an insignificant backdrop district in the countryside of northern China. He worked himself up to the position of governor and slowly gathered a reputation as a reliable and efficient party official, gaining the position of governor of the important province of Shanghai and joining the Politburo in 2007, of which he would, a few years later, become the leader. Xi is, in many ways, what Trump falsely claims to be, a child of privilege who on purpose removed himself from that influence to build his own success. Why though? Because Mao's cultural revolution had left a deep mark on the man. Where others sought to regain powerful positions of the past, Xi believed that the Maoist critique of party cliques had a truth to it. The idea that an official could rise to power through family ties and that an almost hereditary system of governments in a communist state could establish itself was something Xi heavily disliked. Only those who proved themselves the most capable and loyal to the communist cause should be those to lead. In recent years, in many a place in urban China, statues of Marx and communist icons came down to be replaced with statues of Confucius, Lao Tzu and Sun Tzu. Observers in the West interpreted this as a cultural shift away from revolutionary Marxist social doctrine, gradually shifting back to traditional values as a market liberalization took place. That those disenfranchised by Mao came back to have their revenge, but they couldn't have been further from the truth. Neither Confucius, Lao Tzu or Sun Tzu were in any way free market pioneers, let alone paragons of democracy, but the founding philosophers of a social conservative Chinese imperial doctrine of the preservation of a status quo through social harmony. A harmony through obedience, authority, 
and knowing where your place in society is. Values and standards that the Chinese could not only identify with through a more historic identity, formed through a new nationalism that encourages its people to take pride in the nation's pre-communist past, but values that serve the desire of the Chinese state, a state whose priority is that in all policies, harmony must always be preserved at home. Xi Jinping's bid for the Chinese presidency may have started by him conjuring up a self-image as a liberal reformer, but doubt of the sincerity behind that was soon confirmed after a Politburo document leaked to the public, a memo written by Xi outlining his policy doctrine to all members of the Politburo, known as Document No. 9. Its leaker, a dissident journalist, was sentenced to a lengthy prison sentence for leaking state secrets. The document is a list of what Xi considers to be the seven biggest enemies of the Chinese state, constitutional democracy, universal values, individual rights, economic liberalism, free and independent journalism, the spreading of historic truths about Mao Zedong and communist crimes, and the critiquing of Chinese socialism. Xi's vision of China is one of a society in order and prosperity, obedient to its leadership. This is a country in which the public shamings of the Cultural Revolution are still alive, with exhibitions in town halls showing and shaming condemned people. A country in which posting the wrong thing on social media can get you not only a prison sentence, but to be publicly shamed on national television. <laughs> This is a country in which the president is welcomed by the news staff like a boss or colleague rather than being questioned. This is a country with a surveillance system never before seen in human history in terms of how deep it can stare into the private lives of its citizens. And the economic growth blinded many to see through the growing profits to realize that the society behind it was still very much an authoritarian communist state. Modern China merely ascribes to a more pragmatic communism than other entities. It doesn't wish to end up like North Korea, so it engages in international organizations and diplomacy. It doesn't want to end up like the Soviet Union, so it partially liberalized its markets. But Xi's China also seeks to legitimize its regime by attempting to tie it to the larger history and story of China. A history it once shunned has been made vogue, and figures once denounced have been resurrected as nationalist heroes of an independent China. But most crucially to Xi and Xi's main mission and agenda is to rebuild the geopolitical power that this past empire once had. Key to that is a largely unknown politician, Xi's chief foreign policy advisor, Wang Huning, who formulated Xi's foreign policy doctrine of prosperity through authority, known as the Chinese dream. Sinaitization. It's a word you have probably never heard before. It has a small Wikipedia article that doesn't do the term justice. And even though I am not someone who likes to make predictions, I will wager that this is a term you will be hearing a lot more from politicians, demagogues, and media outlets in the next 20 years. It's similar to Islamization in that it is a word describing a real process, definitely a historic event, but is also a word easily abused by demagogues. So what is Sinaitization? What we call the Chinese are the Han Chinese. In fact, many of the stereotypes associated with China are not even Chinese. These tight silk dresses, as well as this hairstyle, are not Han Chinese, but Manchu, who are an ethnic minority of northern China that came to rule the empire throughout its last 200 years. The Han Chinese originated from the fertile valleys of the Yellow River Basin. So the question is, how did they end up ruling all of this? The answer is Sinazization. When the Han conquered the people who bordered them, they didn't just levy taxes from them and establish a tributary as so many ancient empires did. They engaged in an aggressive cultural assimilation. Han language, Han food, Han bureaucracy, Han culture, Han festivities, Han taxes, Han administration, Han laws, Han marriages, Han everything, until the once conquered peoples turned into Han. Once done, you look at those who bordered the newly assimilated Han and repeat the process. Throughout thousands of years, a small kingdom at the basin of the Yellow River stretched its influence out from the deserts of Central Asia to the Himalayas to the steppes of Mongolia to the jungles of Southeast Asia. From Turkic horsemen, Russian migrants, Koreans and Vietnamese ethnic groups, the Han assimilated them all into one empire under one language and culture. 
Only a few ethnic enclaves remain, mostly in the outer borderlands of the barren steppes of Inner Mongolia, the isolated villages of the Himalayas, the Gobi Desert small communities, or in towns hidden in the labyrinthian plateaus of southern China. To give you an idea of how effective this process is, the indigenous people of what we now know as Taiwan were Austronesians, dark-skinned, boat-faring communities of fishermen and warriors who originated from Madagascar. In language and culture, they had more in common with the New Zealand Maori or Hawaiians who they were related to. And when the Chinese arrived in the 1600s, slowly over the course of 400 years of Sinazization, they were turned into what are Chinese, with segments of Austronesian culture intertwined in a largely Chinese people. Throughout the last centuries, China has changed, more so than many other nations, yet some things seem to not have changed at all. The assimilation of peoples is now more forceful, but it is also worth pointing out that Muslims being force-fed pork or Tibetans having a communist clergy appointed by the state in many ways reflects the sinazization of past Chinese states. That's because every communist entity inherits the geopolitical struggles and ambitions of the entities it replaces. The Soviet Union sought out warm ports and Eastern European dominion, just as the Russian Empire had. East Germany sought out unification and global recognition, just as previous German entities had. Vietnam sought out independence and Poland sought out sovereignty. Communist China not only inherited a revived populist nationalism and the desire to assimilate foreigners from its forebears, but the same geopolitical ambitions to restore Chinese dominion and power. Before the century of humiliation, China was the unquestioned regional power with a vast tributary system under which many foreign kings bowed to them. Korea bent its knee to the emperor's will. Persian, Arab, and even African kings lined up to pay tribute. The islands of Malaysia and Indonesia had kings and sultans bending to the emperor's will. By far the biggest nuisance were the Mongols, who at one point were pacified, and the Vietnamese, who refused to be Chinese. Chinese puppets and basically rose up in rebellion once every 100 years, in an endless cycle of Chinese invasion, Vietnamese kicking them out, followed by Chinese invasion and vice versa that lasted for almost 1,500 years, establishing almost a pattern of Vietnam spending its history kicking out foreign invaders. This Chinese dominion over Asia, however, came with many resentments. The Japanese, who despite what Japanese nationalists will tell you, were once a Chinese tributary, were the first to tell the Chinese to sod off. The Dutch snatched Indonesia. When the Vietnamese kicked out the Chinese again in 1800 for the gazillionth time, the French took advantage and invaded Vietnam. Piece after piece, Chinese spheres of influence were snatched by other powers. And this came not only with a colonial legacy in these countries, but with the backlash against ethnic Chinese in these regions. As China's power waned, Chinese minorities in Asia got the brunt, from Vietnam to Malaysia, culminating in 1966 when under the trumped-up justification of purging communists, an Islamist Indonesian government massacred its Chinese minority in a largely forgotten genocide. The founding of Singapore in many ways was due to a city with a Chinese majority being unwilling to bow to a Muslim majority of Malayan state. In Malaysia itself, ethnic Chinese lived for decades as second-hand citizens in a state. Vietnam, despite being communist as well as North Korea, shunned closer relations with their once imperial overlord in favor to closer ties with the Soviet Union. To this day, despite the fact that many of these East Asian nations spent almost a century at each other's throats, were at the throats of others, many are united in distrust and suspicion over their big neighbor who once had held dominion over them all. That distrust runs so deep that Vietnam, when opening to the outside world again, first opened to the United States before it did to China. When rebuilding the sphere of influence China once had, it faces an enormous set of challenges. It operates in a sphere dominated by the Americans. The states it used to command and control are not only independent, but deeply distrustful of her. But China is determined, especially under Xi, to rebuild what it once had. And the best way of doing so is by observing how others had gained it. In the 1850s, the Chinese economy collapsed. The reason was that its market was flooded with cheap products manufactured and imported from Europe and North America. Chinese manufacturers simply couldn't compete, giving foreign producers and countries power over the Chinese economy. Can we turn this concept around on its head? Check. 
Britain gained Hong Kong in 1843 by leasing it from China for 99 years. Britain did so as part of war reparations that China had to pay. How can we turn that around without all the costs of war? The Chinese dream policy of Xi Jinping built a large system of loans in which countries that had trouble receiving loans from Western financial institutions due to instability and the authoritarian nature of their regime could easily receive such. Countries like Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka went through a decades-long civil war with many a human rights violation, ethnic cleansings and other horrible deeds that made it unwelcome to many Western creditors. Sri Lanka, however, also happens to sit on a linchpin of the global economy. Shipping between the Middle East, Africa, Europe and Asia goes through Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka took a large loan to build a deep water harbour to take part in global trade and profit from its geographically beneficial location. However, Sri Lanka couldn't pay that loan back to its creditors, who were the Chinese government, to which the Chinese had a simple solution. Just lease us this port for 99 years. Now China owns and controls a port at one of the world's most important locations with workers exclusively Chinese. Sri Lankan workers protested, but the Sri Lankan police were ordered to crack down. This process repeated itself throughout many a country. Pakistan couldn't pay back the massive loan it had taken from China. No problem, just lease us this scrap of beach, Gwadar, which has a natural harbour that a few hundred years ago used to be one of the main sea routes between Arabia, Africa and Central Asia. And sure enough, the Chinese built a deep water harbour and populated it with Chinese workers. This process repeated itself in Tanzania, Djibouti, Kenya, Mozambique, the Maldives, Bangladesh and Burma. In Malaysia, the Chinese government gave the Malaysian government a massive investment to build a completely new city filled with financial and business centres, massive apartment complexes and large educational facilities right next to Singapore to compete with and take away some of its business and influence on the Malacca Straits, making free vast artificial islands and filling them with skyscrapers and properties. Far too late did the Malaysian government find out that the vast majority of apartments and property were sold to the mainland Chinese and that this deep water port and financial centre would essentially be a Chinese outpost in the Malacca Straits. In the 1600s, the Dutch and Portuguese built a vast trade empire by not conquering and colonizing vast lands, but by establishing small trade ports and forts called factoria with which they could establish and guard exclusive trading routes around the world. Today's analysts may call what the Chinese are doing the string of pearls strategy, but looking at all the Chinese are doing, it doesn't seem very new. In fact, it's almost like they spent the last century studying the histories of past empires to think of ways to copy them. And what is going on here is very obvious. It's a Chinese attempt to gain control over the trade networks of the Indian and East Asian oceans. What is less obvious is what you don't see when you connect the dots. Not a single path leads to India. Far from just a mere economic power play, this geopolitical initiative seeks to isolate its main continental rival from the global trade networks that are being established. In Papua New Guinea, China is building a railroad network. Fiji and Timor-Leste all leased ports to the Chinese. And some of them don't even make any sense. Why would you need a deep water harbour on an island in the middle of nowhere at the outer rim of the Pacific? It has no economic value. Only strategic value if you were to say, guard the Asian Pacific against anything that might be coming from the American Pacific coastline with, say, some battle cruisers or some aircraft carriers that China had been secretly building. However, many insisted that there was nothing to worry about. The Chinese government always insisted that it would never have foreign military bases. It always criticized the Americans for having such, and that it would never do what it called the American way of geopolitics. Its harbors from Pakistan to Djibouti would never host Chinese troops and warships. Xi even publicly stated this at a press conference with Obama at the White House. Just a few years later, barely into a year after Trump's election, the Chinese Navy and Chinese Marines were stationed in Djibouti. This is largely unknown to the public, which was largely distracted at the time with news stories about the pedantic squabbling around Trump's election. Djibouti is a key location in the world. It lies at the Horn of Africa. The French, Americans, British, Italians, Spanish and even the Germans have troops stationed there. It's from where all anti-piracy operations in the region are commanded. It allows for quick access to most of the Middle East. And suddenly, out of the blue, Chinese soldiers were there. With the world distracted by Trump's first year in office, things suddenly moved quickly. 
a Chinese military base popped up in Cambodia, and Chinese troops set up base in the Afghan highlands. But most curious and surprising of all, Chinese troops were stationed in Tajikistan. For centuries since the Russians drove out the Mongols, they seized control of Central Asia to ensure no Asians would ever surprise them again. But in recent years, so distracted with trying to interfere and gain power in the West, Russia didn't even notice China slowly nibbling away at its backyard. China became an expert at finding and taking advantage of opportunities, finding moments when the world was distracted and turning what seemed at first to be disasters into an opportunity. One of Trump's first actions in office was to pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a free trade agreement between various Pacific nations. But rather than just being a failure and defeat for China as Trump and his supporters expected it to be, the Chinese turned it into an opportunity that played exactly into their hands, leading the negotiations for a new free trade agreement without the Americans within which they would be the dominant power. The 15th of January 2017, a day that will go down in the history books, is when China had one of its greatest triumphs. At the World Economic Forum, an event hosted by the elites of global capitalism, the president of the Chinese Communist State was the opening speaker, lecturing the world on how to do proper and more free trade, and how his nation would take a leading position in such. America's president wasn't even present. China has played an increasing role in opening markets and has, through that, increased its global power and influence. But what is China's free trade Chinese dream outside from the ports it builds and trade routes it aims to control? Africa has for decades been a continent plagued by stagnant economies and lack of commerce. The reason for this is to be found in the sheer enormity of barriers set up by individual countries. Only 17% of trade by African countries is done with other African countries. Take for example Cameroon. Moving goods from Cameroon to its neighbor Chad, a one-day truck trip of 600 miles, costs six times as much as moving goods from Cameroon over 7,500 miles to Hong Kong. The tariffs, regulations and taxes in place were created in a post-colonial era by nationalist and socialist African leaders to create national economic self-sufficiency, but in the end crippled many African economies. Incidentally, African countries that have recently done well are also the ones that did away with these archaic restrictions. And this is where China saw an opportunity for its free trade concept that in the end isn't all that free. Resources in exchange for infrastructure, consume in exchange for education. China's move into Africa was predominantly to create one thing above all, a source of material to make products and to create new markets to which to sell these products. Africa is to be a new Chinese outlet market, to buy Chinese goods, but not for China to necessarily buy any African manufactured goods. This is the concept China wishes to implement throughout its sphere of influence. Everyone should line up to buy Chinese goods and work to be able to buy those goods. And in the end, there is nothing new about it. It's almost like a return to the old pre-American world order, a trading bloc. And crucially for this trading bloc, it is unified by one thing the authoritarian rulers of their states. The Chinese want to sell to these countries far more than just phones for consumer economies. What do these Venezuelan riot police, Kenyan troops in Somalia, Ecuadorian police, and Sudanese soldiers all have in common? They all use Chinese equipment, Chinese armed vehicles specifically built for riot control, Chinese personnel carriers, Chinese mass surveillance systems, and Chinese rifles. During the Cold War, the democratic world found itself confronted with an undemocratic bloc of nations that restricted itself from full participation in global trade, as well as from cooperation with authoritarian regimes of differing ideologies. China takes a more pragmatic approach, an international bloc bound in trade, united by the leadership's desire to remain in power, no matter what its ideologies may be. China declared its African trade bloc to be united through a common experience as victims of Western imperialism. 
Yet also, copies what those old empires once implemented in preferential trading blocks and outlet markets. In this rifle. You have probably seen this rifle even before this video. It's the standard issue Chinese army assault rifle, the Type 95. It's an okay rifle by all accounts and one thing that makes it really great is that it's incredibly cheap to make and therefore to sell. It's so cheap in fact that if it were to be on sale on the world's biggest private firearm market it is estimated most American firearm owners would get one. But it isn't and won't be for a while. After the way the Chinese government behaved during an event that the Chinese government denies ever happened, the administration of Bush 41 banned all Chinese manufactured weapons from sale in the United States. A ban every single president since has upheld. The same way the Americans found themselves confronted with the problem that some free market countries are not free, China found itself confronted with the problem of free market countries that are free. And those free countries might limit their trade based on how your unfree government may behave. They are accountable to the public for democracy and law. The public in such countries might not approve of business with dictatorships or backdoor dealings with them. So. What do you do with these pesky democracies? Luckily, right around the corner, there's a testing ground. Big, far from other democracies and their attention, a place ideal to test things, such as prison colony systems, nuclear weapons, or just to deport the Irish to ideal to test how the Chinese dream would go with democracy. If you pick up one of the Chinese school books that millions of children across China are educated with, you will find within it what the Chinese state thinks of parliamentary democracy. It's a mess of infighting, interest groups that compete for power, thereby undermining the people. A system that sows discord and undermines social harmony. A system easily undermined through interest groups, corruption and populism. By using a way too overrated ideal of free speech, as well as money to undermine the well-being of the country. Competing interests sideline what should actually matter, the state itself. You could, as many do, sit back and see this as nothing but the Chinese communist state giving justification to its people for their own existence. But there is more to it than that. It's party program and not a lie. It's how the Politburo, its soldiers, its bureaucrats and its diplomats see the democracies of the world. What democratic societies value as their strengths, China sees as their inherent most vulnerable weaknesses. Weaknesses to be exploited. And the mining boom was the perfect launching pad to start off. Coal mined in Australia and sold to China created Australian jobs dependent on the Chinese market. It formed the backbone of ever greater business ties. From coal to milk to aluminium to beef, a third of all Australian exports are by now shipped to China. Suddenly, Chinese billionaires with ties to the Communist Party appeared, investing into Australian business, donating to candidates and seeking ever closer ties into the inner circles of Australian governments. A strew of Australian politicians were forced to resign after taking large donations or just outright bribes from wealthy Chinese individuals with close ties to the Beijing Politburo. China presented itself to Labour as fellow social democrats concerned with the welfare and well-being of the working people, while presenting itself to the conservatives as savvy investors and job creators, ensuring that no matter who may be in the prime minister's office, Beijing would get its slice of the cake. Anti-racism social justice organizations with suspiciously close ties to Beijing set out to find, shame and condemn those who dared speak of an ever encroaching Chinese influence. Meanwhile, China started buying into valuable Australian assets sold off by conservative governments, such as ever increasing Chinese ownership of Australia's drinking water rights, a crucial resource in a country like Australia. Australian ministers forced into resignation over corruption probes hold speeches on and promote the ever-increasing economic interdependence between Australia and China, which by and large goes unnoticed by the rest of the world. China's portfolio in Australia is by now $6.3 billion in size in assets such as gas, coal, real estate, water and railroads. It is by now undeniable that Chinese influence over Australian politics has contributed to decisions the consequences of which Australia will have to struggle with in the future. But for China, this was just a test run.
The concept of Europe is a phrase referring to Europe before the First World War, a delicate balance of powers amongst competing nations attempting to grow their influence without upsetting the balance to such an extent that others would come down on them. Adding another world war and the European powers conclude that sharing is caring. However, the European Union is in many ways still to this day a delicate balance of powers within which positions of power are still sought after and exercised for more economic and institutional means. Outsiders usually don't get involved in this, because when they do, it usually ends up with everyone hating them. For the past decades, European countries are more than willing to annoy each other, but tend to rally together when outsiders try to mess with them. However, in recent years, that balance shifted dramatically. The Euro crisis and recession put Germany in a position of power, upsetting European balances of power, bailing out heavily indebted countries and forcing strict austerity measures upon them. Measures that in Greece, more than anywhere else, caused social discord resentments, poverty and political instability and restructuring. The French, heavily suspicious of any German gain in power, attempted for years to build new alliances of Mediterranean nations in an attempt to create a counterbalance to ever-increasing German power with weird inner European organizations that mostly failed due to the lack of financial, economic and political credit to back any of this up. But someone else watched all this and saw opportunity. Piraeus is a harbour in southern Greece, about six miles from Athens. The harbour and shipbuilding industry was once the lifeblood of the Greek economy throughout the 70s and 80s. Little of it remained after the country's economic collapse. When China rolled in to buy the port of Piraeus from a left-wing government, there were some eyebrows raised, but little protest. The Chinese promised and worked on making Piraeus the largest Mediterranean and eventually European harbour. Connected with Chinese-built railroads throughout the Balkans, the the intention is to make Piraeus the destination of all goods transported from Asia to Europe. Sparked by this, China went on a barely noticed shopping tour. Genoa, Marseille, Valencia, Bilbao, Nantes, Le Havre, Dunkirk, Antwerp, Bruges, ports bought by Chinese groups across the European coastline. By 2018, 10% of all European harbours were controlled by China. Agricultural, logistics and technology firms were bought up in Switzerland, including China's biggest foreign asset, the agricultural giant Syngenta, acquired for $43 billion. Major Chinese shopping tours were undertaken in Portugal and France, such as the Chinese microchip manufacturer Lincense, where corporations once feared Chinese corporate espionage, China now just buys them. But no country was as eager to sell off as many of its assets as possible to the Chinese as the British, even setting up its own British investment fund to manage and promote the sale of British business and assets to the Chinese, run by the former British Prime Minister David Cameron. By and large, Chinese money goes into buying real estate and into the UK's energy sector, the intention being to build Chinese nuclear power plants for the UK in the near future. British governments seem little concerned. In post-Brexit Britain, China can easily present itself as a savvy investor and business partner who are the solution to Britain's future outside of a European market. And the opposition doesn't care much either. The SNP is just as willing to sell whatever it can sell in Scotland to China. And the Labour Party is quite cosy and comfy with Xi. To the Greeks and Portuguese, China presented itself as a fellow socialist concerned with the ever-increasing Mediterranean poverty, presenting itself as a saviour from the ruthless capital of Northern Europe. In Eastern Europe, China appeals to right-wing authoritarian populists with a common authoritarian, less democratic zeal. European suspicions didn't start to rise until the Chinese started buying into German car industries and Dutch harbours, both of which are industry sectors vital to national economies. So it was the Dutch and the Germans who were the first to sound the alarm and suspicion of an ever-increasing Chinese economic and fiscal influence in Europe. And it may be easy to look and not see much to be worried about, but the impact this has had on Europe is nothing short of extraordinary. Every year the European Union publishes a report on the state of human rights in China, a summary of the state of rights and liberties in the country. Nothing binding, but still supposed to be a guideline for European leaders on who to do what kind of business with, if any at all, as well as the document the United Nations rely on for their overall report. China never exactly received the most glamorous of ratings on these, but not that it had to worry them, because the reports stopped being made in 2018.
vetoed by the Greek government, one of the largest recipients of Chinese investments. Hungary cancelled all commitment to improvement of the human rights situation abroad as part of the European Union, its Prime Minister even openly praising China as a reliable system of governance for the future. The former French Prime Minister Jean-Pierre Referin openly argues that with an increasingly volatile United States, Europe's future is to abandon its alliance with the United States for deeper ties with China. In June 2017, when the French President proposed a law that would bar foreign investors from from buying up and taking over strategically important European industries and businesses and protect European workers from foreign practices, his proposal, backed by almost all of the European left, was vetoed by the Socialist Prime Minister of Portugal, who openly told the French President that it was China who had saved Portugal during the crisis and therefore Portugal will protect China in Europe. You might find these examples to be too small to care about which they are not. But even if you don't see the significance in the policies, they represent something extraordinary, the danger of which cannot be understated. At the height of its power, the Soviet Union was a truly terrifying entity, an ideological empire determined to spread its policies and doctrines as far and wide as possible, ruthless and brutal with any and all dissidents, owning the largest nuclear arsenal in the world, fielding one of the world's most sophisticated and effective spy networks, and more than able and willing to use its enormous military might to bully, pressure and fight others into submission. But the only thing the Soviet Union could do to attempt to influence the policies of European democracies was to threaten and hope it didn't backfire. For all its military might and power, the only measure the Soviets had to influence European democracies was the application of hard power, which more often than not fails completely. China accomplished something the Soviets couldn't even dream of. Soft power. China is in Europe's democratic process. It's in interest groups, in economic and financial ties, and can influence the policies of European democracies from inside. It can sway political decisions in its favor, silence critique with mere finance, push for agendas in cabinets that go in its favors, and all of it without force in ways that would have made the KGB turn red and green with envy. The architect of it, a man barely anyone knows, who you see at every state visit of the Chinese president, every major political Chinese event, and always close to the president. Xi's chief foreign policy advisor, Wang Huning. The developments described in this video have taken place throughout the past four years, and what none of them even illustrate is the increasing brazenness with which China acts. In late 2015, bookstore owners who sold books critical of the Chinese president and government in Hong Kong were kidnapped, dragged off to the mainland of China, and forced into making confessions to sedition, which they retracted once they were free. The brazenness with which China had acted caused a stir throughout Hong Kong, the resulting protest waves last to this day. China doesn't even bother hiding the massive redeployment of troops around the protest in Hong Kong, doing so while the world watches and memories of those events the government keeps denying are still somewhat fresh. The number of political prisoners has increased by the hundreds of thousands, set up to be mocked and ridiculed in a legal framework that made public shaming part of the justice system. Millions of minorities are arrested to be forcefully culturally assimilated in camps out in the borderlands. The militarization of the South China Sea, which was done with extraordinary speed, transforming little reefs into air bases, the sudden speed with which China set up foreign army and navy bases, and the build of the Chinese armed forces itself, which by now has reached the capacity of the French army, an army that many analysts agree is built not just for protection of the Chinese mainland, but for foreign intervention. China has not acted so aggressively on the international stage since the days of Mao, and most of the world doesn't even seem to notice. China, in fact, seems to rely on that. A world distracted by a clownish American president gave it ample opportunity to go out and expand its influence in ways nobody predicted. And the way Trump engaged China is almost comedic. China, 
You go over to China. 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 You take China. 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 A soundbite president, he surely likes to do the talk, providing ample soundbites for Fox News and various online commentators about China this, China that. But what has actually been done under his leadership? Pulling out of the TPP gave China an opportunity to expand its influence over the Pacific by inserting itself to leading negotiations for new trade treaties without the Americans. So, a Trump policy that clearly backfired. The Trump policy most celebrated by his supporters are the tariffs on Chinese goods. Exporting made in China to the United States became more expensive. So, what do you think happened next? Well, they just sold more to others at less of a cost. Yes, after all, they spent the recent years opening more markets. Sometimes you have to wonder what the Trump administration and its supporters thought would happen. Did they seriously believe that China would come begging for them to lift a tax? It gets even better though. The Chinese are selling the products that Trump put tariffs on to you, the American consumer, without tariffs. How? When the tariffs came up, one of the first things the Chinese did was build and open factories in Vietnam and Malaysia. Take a Huawei phone. What China does is assemble the phone to 90% completion in a Chinese factory, then take the unfinished phones, ship them to the factories in Malaysia or Vietnam, add the final microchip, get the made in Vietnam or made in Malaysia stamp and ship it off to the United States without paying the tariffs on Chinese goods. This is one of the oldest tricks in the books. American car manufacturers like to build cars to 90% completion in cheap Mexican factories, ship the slightly unfinished car to the United States, add whatever is missing and suddenly the car is made in the USA. The Dutch did this with pepper to avoid Danish tariffs in the 1700s. And we even have archaeological evidence of Carthaginian merchants doing this 2,400 years ago with wine. This has been part and parcel of commerce long before a certain Scotsman observed it and wrote a book about it. It's an outcome that should have been so obvious that I have no idea why the Trump administration thought this wouldn't happen and pass tariffs that essentially are worthless measures. So this policy clearly backfired. But this policy gets even worse. Malaysia and Vietnam are two countries that have always stood in opposition or at the very least suspicion of Chinese influence in the region. It's why both these countries saw deeper ties with the United States over recent decades. Trump turned China into job creators in those countries, furthering an economic interdependence that strengthens China's regional power. This more than just backfired and is a perfect example of something. Watching Trump on the international stage with China is like watching a Tom and Jerry cartoon. He is consistently outwitted, outmaneuvered and taken for a fool at every single opportunity by the Chinese. The fundamental problem with Trump and his obnoxious stupid foreign policy is that he believes he is a businessman and drives his foreign policy on that belief. The issue with China though is that it is not an economic challenge but the geopolitical challenge, which leads Trump to such great political moves as imposing tariffs on China's biggest regional rival. India, thereby inadvertently strengthening China. Any reasonable diplomat or leader with a bare minimum of strategic understanding would have sought out to strengthen ties with India in confronting the ever-growing Chinese geopolitical dominance. There were many attempts to use trade as a way to outfox China's ever-growing influence. Trade agreements like the TPP or Obama's failed attempt with a trade agreement with the EU. What is essential to either is the existence of a coherent group of countries allied in a common purpose of furthering each other's economic growth and keeping out others. But the random nature with which Trump imposes tariffs from goods such as Italian luxury foods to Indian aluminium makes the idea of any coherent bound interest group or alliance in trade evaporate into thin air. Instead, Trump seems to be more interested in deliberately berating American allies and partners who increasingly look to China for a more calm, collected, predictable and mature partner in commerce. You also don't open new markets or make new friends by calling them shitholes. Another factor is simply Trump's clownish presidency itself. The fact that this man's Twitter feed can fill up the evening news as China expands its military presence in the South Pacific, Africa, Central Asia, builds more ports and redraws the entire global trading system to be more and more under its thumb 
speaks volumes of what this president's priorities are, namely certainly not his country's role in the world. China has taken full advantage of his presidency, more so than anyone else, to aggressively push further than any previous Chinese government and set its global ambitions into stone, while everyone else was distracted with a funny-looking blonde man, because apparently his presidency is all about triggering the libs, and no actual coherent policy. He lacks any vision for the future of his country in the world, in fact, his isolationism, the American first nationalism that he proposes, is a policy of which he doesn't even seem to understand how much it plays into the hands of the Chinese Politburo. China would love nothing more than to return to the old world order, where it was the center of everything and everyone revolved their global ambitions around getting as beneficial a position as possible in relation to China. The Chinese government would love nothing more than a United States that seals itself off from the world so it can take its place. Twenty years from now, we will find ourselves in the midst of a new Cold War. A Cold War that will be nothing like the last one, where simple limitations on trade crippled a communist bloc terminally, because it was hell-bent on ideology and refused to give up on catastrophic economic concepts. We will find ourselves instead confronted with a bloc of unfree nations united merely by authoritarian nature. A set of states willing to engage in business. A communist power for which pragmatic victories are more important than ideological stubbornness. An effective leadership of efficient, ruthless and strategically minded leaders determined to make the best out of every opportunity that presents itself. And the historians looking back to us will determine that it was this presidency which gave the Chinese enough power to kick it off. Trump is China's president of the United States. Dealing with what will be the most important challenge of our time will require more strategic and sound minds than Trump, but also a rethinking of the fundamentals of Western democratic foreign policy. The old Cold War assumption that capitalism will bring liberty and democracy died on Tiananmen Square and the ruins of the deregulated free market that Bush created in Iraq. Authoritarian states can have free markets, tyrants can prosper under capitalism, market forces can be used to further and spread tyranny. Liberty is not inherently tied to commerce, and a new foreign policy that promotes liberty and democracy above all is needed as is a reassertion of what the values of a free society truly are. What makes one free isn't necessarily what makes one wealthy. This video was largely inspired by two books, The Perfect Dictatorship, China in the 21st Century by Steinringen, a Norwegian sociologist and professor of sociology at Oxford, a book that will give you a more than sufficient overview of the modern Chinese communist state, and The China Dream by Liu Mingfu. Liu Mingfu is a Chinese army colonel and member of the Chinese Communist Party. The book is a Chinese declaration on why democracy failed and why, in his view, there will be a post-American Chinese era soon. It gives you a great insight into the thought process of the Chinese Communist Party and how its members see the world. Now, if you wish to have more videos coming up, remember to donate to PayPal or become a patron. If you're a patron, you will also get to vote on which video I should make next. If you wish to give feedback and discuss the video, you can join my Discord community. A link to which is in the description. Until the next time. China.